Okay, so uh, here we're going to talk about the rise of the new thought, the new thought movement. <laughs> very, 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 very important and influential in terms of contemporary spirituality. Honestly, it's huge, huge, huge. And this movement is going to teach the key idea of the power of belief, the power of the mind over matter. All right, uh, the whole, all this talk about the law of attraction is a key thing that comes out of this movement. All right, so where does this all begin? Well, we have to go back again to the 1830s in America, where, you know, we saw that spiritualism was beginning here and more, more or less really more in the 40s, but that spiritualism had grown out of mesmerism that had come to America in the 30s, okay? And as I mentioned before, uh, these mesmerists were going up and down the Eastern seaboard demonstrating mesmerism, uh, bringing people under hypnosis, and <laughs> people were just fascinated with the various types of phenomena that would occur. Right? And that's how contacting the dead starts to open up, people experiencing that, and that developed into spiritualism. Right? Uh, then also psychic kind of abilities, being able to know things you cannot know, and also healing. The healing of people happens. And so people were widely experimenting with mesmerism at this time and learning how to do it. Okay, And so as I say here, this movement did not just focus strictly on psychic abilities, uh, you know, developing your, your psychic power to know things you can't possibly know, uh, to find hidden objects, to know things about people's lives, their past, uh, to know about their dead relatives, contact dead relatives, whatever. Uh, it, you know, we had that sort of going on and that developed into spiritualism coming out of mesmerism but then as we saw out of theosophy as it develops it talks about you know the the soul journeying onto other planes and dimensions of reality so you have all of this stuff going on but here uh that's going to get connected with the new thought movement is where mesmerism is going to be used as a way to demonstrate and access how the mind is so powerful one's thoughts, one's beliefs are so powerful that they can shape reality. And that's how some people are going, they're going to work with mesmerism and take it in this direction, a totally different direction, right, of the power of mind over matter. And the very famous film, The Secret, that came out in 2006, that made over 65 million, right, very popular, uh, really uh, focused and, and demonstrates and, and expounds upon the teachings coming out of the New Thought Movement here on this very idea of the power of the mind, what they often refer to as the law of attraction, that what you think, what you feel, what you send out there as a vibrational frequency, that then will attract uh, what you're thinking and feeling. Okay, and that's sort of the key idea. And I will be posting a link that hopefully you should be able to watch it online. Okay, and normally I would show it in class. Anyway, uh, yeah, this is what it's going to develop into. And again, extremely popular. Oprah was big on this, you know, in terms of uh, Oprah, Ellen DeGeneres, um, various celebrities, very, very influential. Okay. All right. So where does this all begin here? It begins with this figure of Phineas Parkhurst Quimby, who lived here, as you can see, in the 1800s. He's going to become the founder of what's going to become known as the New Thought Movement, sometimes also called the Mind Cure Movement, uh, emphasizing that, you know, you need to change your thinking, <laughs> uh, think in a new way. And if you change your mind, right, change your thinking, it can cure you, it can heal you of diseases, right? This is sort of how it begins. So Quimby himself, he was really never a, a church type of person, but yet he very much had faith. He believed in God. He believed, you know, basically in Christianity in a loose way, but not really a rigid church goer or member. He was a clockmaker with pretty little minimal education. And in 1839 is where he attended one of these lectures and demonstrations on mesmerism that was happening. And in two years, he then started, you know, over two years, he studied it, learned it, uh, was taught about it, and then started to practice it. And he linked up with this young guy called Lucius Berkmar, who easily went into trance when he got mesmerized. And so while he was mesmerized, 
uh, Lucius would be able to tell things about people, you know, tell them where they lost their keys the other day, or, or you know, that this is the problem with their horse that might be sick, or, uh, you know, they, they maybe put on a slip, slip of paper the name of a dead relative, and then he'd be able to give all kinds of details about this dead relative, uh, again, proving that somehow he's connecting with the dead. And at times he would claim to be able to connect with the dead. He would um, be able to see what certain people's illnesses were, provide a diagnosis and saying, yes, there's somebody here who has stomach pain. Uh, this is what the problem is, you know, and this is what you need to do to cure it. Take this kind of a herb or do this or do that. You know, he'll prescribe some kind of a cure, a remedy of some kind to heal this person. And so um, Quimby kind of worked with him with groups of people and then started to focus it more on healing people. Um, as Burkmar developed his abilities, it started to hone in more on healing, providing a diagnosis and cure. And, and so through this, all right, what starts to happen for Quimby, Quimby himself had uh, some kind of pain, I guess it was in his back or something. And uh, he went to the doctor and the doctors told him, oh, you have a failing kidney. You have got, you've got kidney problems. And Burkmar didn't know this. And, uh, and so one day, uh, Burkmar tells him, oh, um, you've got kidney problems in, in Burkmar. And uh, Quimby wondered, how did you know? He didn't tell him. And he says, listen, wait. he said, uh, one of your kidneys has totally failed. The other one's very weak uh, here. And Burkmar then says, let me fix it for you. He puts his hand on uh, Quimby's back and, and says he's doing something, almost like how you've, you know, maybe you've come across, um, you know, psychic healers, uh, those who do sort of what the often is called psychic surgery. You know, they'll cut you open with a rusty knife and, you know, dig around inside of you and pull out some cancerous tumor or something and then put their hand back over and ta-da, you're all healed up. Uh, you know, people actually witness these sorts of things, okay? <laughs> they literally have. I remember reading about a doctor who saw it and just, it just so blew his mind, he couldn't cope. He, he just became speechless and, and just walked away. He couldn't handle what he just witnessed and saw because he's trying to prove it as fraudulent. But anyways, that's all. I'm getting off on another topic. But you'll have these sorts of things. So it seems almost as though Burkmar was doing something like this. And uh, to Quimby, in terms of healing this, uh, what was the doctors told him was a kidney problem. And then Quimby noticed that, well, after, after that uh, Burkmar did this to him, he never had any more pain in his back. And, and so he started to wonder, okay, there's a few things that happen here. So he starts wondering about that. Another thing that happens is that sometimes Burkmar would prescribe a cure for people's illnesses that was really bizarre and very difficult to do. Like I remember coming across one where he said, to cure this, you should kill a rat and while the skin is still warm, put it on your ear and it will cure you of something, right? I forget now what it was, but you know, it'd do a cure, a healing by getting the skin of a dead rat and while the flesh is still warm, put it on your ear. And, uh, and so some of these things were pretty far up. And Quimby started to question, like, how on earth can some of these things cure people? And, and sometimes it'd be very expensive. So then he would then uh, suggest to the person that instead of doing this expensive or difficult cure, he came up with a more simplified, easier cure for the person to do. And he found that it still worked, all right, that it still worked. And so then he started to think, well, geez, you know, maybe, maybe it's all about the mind. Maybe Burkmar knew, or, you know, that I had a kidney problem because that's what the doctors told me and that's what I had in my mind. And maybe Burkmar is just reading my mind. All right. And then he thought, well, maybe Burkmar is just reading the minds of the people in the audience. Maybe he's really not contacting somebody's dead grandmother, but is just reading that person's mind who has information about the dead grandmother. Are you guys with me here? This is a very important thing. So he started to doubt the spiritualist line that, you know, he's actually contacting spirits of the dead and getting information. Instead, he started to think that maybe he's just reading people's minds. And he started to test this so that he thought, okay, I'm wondering, you know, he would kind of quietly in his mind start thinking of something really funny in his mind, right? Just having a thought of something hilarious. And then he noticed all of a sudden Burkmar would start laughing, 
right? And then he'd think about something really scary and frightening. And he'd notice that Birkmar started to become edgy. And then he realized that, wow, you know, when I hypnotize him, I'm establishing some kind of a mental link, a psychic link. Our psyches, our minds are connecting here. And he's just kind of reading my mind through this mesmerism, all right? So he started to question what's going on. And as a result, he started to think that people are actually not being cured by some of these bizarre remedies that Birkmar would give them, but they're being cured by their belief in these remedies. That if the spirit you know, of my dead grandmother said that if I do this and this, uh, it will cure me of this disease that the doctors told me I had, uh, that indeed this would work. And this is the conclusion he came to is he held it was all about beliefs. And he started to think that when you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you that you have such and such disease and that you may only have a few months to live, you know, like, you know, you know you've got terminal cancer and uh, whatever, whatever it is, it then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that it is your belief in the doctor, in the diagnosis, that then gives you even more so that disease and locks it in place. However, if you are told that if this is the this pill here will cure you of it, right? And you so believe this is a magic pill of medicine that will cure you. And if I take it every day, oh, I'm going to be cured of this disease, then you will be cured of that disease. That the it's all in the mind. <clears throat> And so really, he discovered what later on scientists would call the placebo effect, okay? You know, and this is why in a lot of research, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in medicine, you know, they always have to test to see if there isn't an issue of the placebo effect. That's just about people's belief that this pill will cure them uh, is the factor at play in their getting better instead of actually being the medicine in the pill that's making them better because it's very, very real. <laughs> so anyways, make a long story short, this is the transition. This is what happens for Quimby. He starts going a different way with mesmerism. Instead of using mesmerism as though it as a technique actually heals people through magnetic energy or the energy of the hands, all right? Some kind of healing energy like that or that through mesmerism, you're contacting the spirits of the dead in some way. He held that no, what can happen here is you are so shifting people's beliefs and expectations that their own beliefs are what's curing them, right? And that's why you're, you're planting into their mind a new belief of the possibility of healing and being cured and that it is the power of the mind over the body, over matter. That is the key thing that's being tapped in here. All right. So this is the key thing. So he then, um, he ends up healing people. He hardly charged anything for people's healings. And he developed his own technique and method of just changing people's beliefs regarding their illness. Okay. And so the key concepts he developed is that disease itself is simply a matter of wrong belief. And a cure is essentially a correction of those beliefs. And so his goal became one of changing the mind of the patient. He held that truth is the cure, right? False teachings, wrong ideas, uh, a wrong, the false idea of disease and illness, right? That is the problem is when we start to believe these false and wrong ideas. Uh, that is our problem. We need to shift our thinking away from falsehoods into the truth that health is our destiny because we were created to be healthy, right? And disease is almost like a distortion of the truth. God did not create disease. God created health. Again, he's very much coming from the Christian faith in the, in the sense of a belief that this world is created by God and that it is good. Life is inherently good by design. It's, it's geared for health, right? And not for disease. And so any form of disease is a corruption of God's creation and a corruption of the truth and that the, the human being needs to have their mind, their belief system in alignment with the truth.
And that's why you should have faith. You need to believe in the truth. This, this is very much similar to what happened in a lot of Christian circles in terms of faith healing. Believe, have faith in God, right? And so this is why he held that Jesus was the greatest healer, the great physician. And he says, this is indeed the science that was taught by Christ. He regarded it as a type of science, and it has its own laws. Just as there are uh, physical material laws, he taught there are also spiritual laws. And spiritual laws that are rooted in the truth of God, right? Uh, they are more powerful, and they can override and overcome the physical laws, okay? And, uh, and that's what happens when miracles take place. A miracle is when the usual physical laws are overridden, overcome by higher, more powerful spiritual laws. All right? And the key with spiritual law is faith, is to believe in the truth, the truth of God, right? The truth of God's goodness, uh, God's creation that's intended for goodness, and well-being, that that is the truth. And we need to be in alignment with that truth. Okay. So as you can see here, God made everything good. And if there's anything wrong, that is, that is the effect of our own wrongdoing. It is our coming out of alignment of the truth. Uh, our accepting disease, our accepting corruptions of the truth. We bring in the falsehood. falsehood through our opinions and by misbeliefs, we're believing the wrong things, okay? So he held that each of us, every human being needs to discover uh, the true God, the divine within our own consciousness. He called it the Christ within, okay? It is the principle of divine sonship and the power that, can, that we all can have that's available to every single one of us in our lives. That divine power uh, of, of, of God really exists within our own consciousness. It is our higher self, our true self, our true nature. And we need to no longer live out of our lower nature, but move into our higher nature. Okay, that's, I think that's on the next slide where it goes in here. Yeah. And this is where he held that there are two selves. There is the higher self. The spiritual man is sort of the term he used. That is the Christ within, or many would call the Christ consciousness. Uh, and then there is the lower self, the natural man, or he called the mind of opinion or the material mind. Okay, that, that easily falls into, entertains the ideas of disease. Right? And when they entertain, the lower self entertains ideas and beliefs of disease and limitation, poverty, uh, depression, you know, anything negative, right? That then uh, goes into the realm of spirit, which is creative. That is the causal um, realm. Uh, this, the realm of spirit is that which has the power to create. And if we implant these wrong uh concepts, these wrong beliefs, and we hold to them, then, then that will indeed get created in our lives. Because the power of creation, the greater power is in the realm of spirit, okay? In, in that kind of more, and this is the causal plane of what we talked about in theosophy, even though he didn't get into theosophy, specifically Quimby, right? But it is, the spiritual is a realm of causation uh, over the material. It has a greater power over the material. Right. And so there's like exactly what I just said a moment ago. These are the spiritual laws. It's a type of spiritual science. And it is superior. They have greater power than natural laws of material science. And as I said, it's a science taught by Christ. Okay. Um, and so he held that, you know, you had Jesus as a human being. That is the human part of Jesus was the, was the human being. Right. But as a human being, Jesus fully embodied and incarnated divinity. And he lived and operated from that higher God self, right? And this is how Jesus is a model, so to speak, for the rest of us. He manifested perfectly and fully the higher power of the divine within him uh, as God incarnate. And that's why Jesus could heal, do the miracles he did, and even rose from the dead. Death could not hold him down. He conquered the power of death, 
right? And he fully embodied and manifested uh, the ideal of what every human being is to become, okay? Divine sonship is what we all participate in, ideally, or meant to, okay? So anyways, this is some of the key ideas of Quimby. Um, and so as an example, he's just saying hypnosis, right? When you are um, given the suggestion under hypnosis that you will not feel pain, you know, you poke the needle and uh, into your body and you, you, you are, have been implanted the suggestion that this will not feel painful whatsoever, right? Well, in hypnosis, that belief becomes dominant. It becomes real. It becomes powerful. And it then, it, for you experientially, has the power to change your experience. So you will not feel pain. And that's an example of how a spiritual law overcomes a material law. Right? That's kind of an idea of, well, a teaching that is often presented here as a metaphor. All right, about that. Okay, so, so this is a key thing here about Quimby. And he held, this is how Jesus healed people. And he told them to have faith. Ask and believe and you shall receive. Anything is possible for those who believe in God, right? And this is, kind of, this is where the New Thought Movement very much has its roots in Christianity and a lot of those teachings in the Bible. And it is going to give birth to what many would call the faith healing movement in Christianity, uh, the prosperity gospel, because it all has a very strong biblical base. And so uh, Quimby is a key figure here in formulating these ideas, this concretely for the first time. All right. Okay. Um, now, let me just backtrack a bit here with Quimby, though, before I go on to Hopkins. Now, Quimby, um, you know, he just healed people. Uh, he ha healed many important people at this time period who then became leaders of all kinds of groups and movements. One of them being Mary Baker Eddy, who's the founder of the Church of Christian Science, or it's also called the Christ Church of Scientists. I think that's what it is. The Church of Christ Scientists. Sorry, the, the Church of Christ Scientists. And, and you'll find that kind of language being used now all the time here. Uh, there's another church of religious science, <laughs> okay? Uh, people kind of start playing, like, and I mentioned before with theosophy, you know, integrating religion and science, and, and that this is a faith. The teachings here can harmonize with science, have a, a basis in science, or is a certain type of science. So you'll find the word science often floating around here in a lot of these groups tied in with Christianity or religion in some way. So Quimby healed a lot of people and had a huge influence. And a lot of these people then became leaders, authors, very influential people in spreading the movement. Uh, Quimby himself didn't really do much to spread the movement. He just was healing people, putting these ideas together. And a lot of his followers said, listen, you've got to make sure you write this stuff down. And he did. He put them all, a lot of his ideas and experiences into uh, some manuscripts. And they didn't get published until after his death, okay, much later, I think in 1921, known as the Quimby Manuscripts. So he wasn't uh, an author and a publisher as such, okay, but his stuff did get written or published later on, much later, okay, as I said, I think it was 1921. However, he influenced a lot of people. He healed a lot of people, and these people are going to become very, very important down the road, and they're going to become founders of all kinds of new denominations, new types of churches that are going to be key here in this whole movement, okay? So, so I'll just mention some of them. Now, here is Emma Curtis Hopkins, okay? And she had initially worked with Mary Baker Eddy, and I don't really want to talk about uh, Christian science, okay, as a denomination, because again, there's just too many groups here. But Mary Baker Eddy is the founder of that. She was healed by Quimby and uh, incorporates Quimby's ideas, but then later claims them to be her own ideas that she received as a revelation from Jesus himself, okay? And so she can then started her own church based on these ideas, and that's the, you know, the Church of Christian Science, okay? Now, Hopkins worked with her originally because uh, in, in, she was a, embraced a lot of these ideas, 
but then they had to part ways because Eddie was very controlling, very controlling. She didn't want to acknowledge that anybody else shared these ideas or had any access to these ideas, but that these ideas were uniquely her own. Her own. She was very possessive and authoritarian. And Hopkins felt that, no, these ideas should spread out to all kinds of people and there shouldn't be this kind of control element uh, of just limiting these ideas just to her own particular church that Eddie had founded, right? So Hopkins wanted it to spread out. And so she started then uh, teaching her own classes in Chicago, and it became known as the Christian Science Theological Seminary. And in her lifetime, she taught over 50,000 people. Okay. And many of whom will become leaders of their own denominations and churches that are going to come out of this. And one of these people that she taught here is Wallace D. Wattles. He wrote the book, The Science of Getting Rich. And the film, The Secret, that I had mentioned earlier, right, that uh, features Bob Proctor in there. And I hope you watch the film because it's very influential, these teachings. Uh, Bob Park, he, uh, his whole thinking is based on Wattles' book, The Science of Getting Rich. And that is central to the whole film of The Secret. <laughs> okay. The secret is, uh, of, you know, the, how belief creates your reality. What you believe, what you think can heal you from illness, can bring you the love of your life, can bring you rich, riches and prosperity and success in life. That is the secret. Is They often call it the law of attraction, but it really is. The law of attraction is your beliefs will generate a certain kind of vibrational frequency that will attract what you most think about, okay, and what you most feel and emotionally have in, in your life the kind of energy that your life is generating you will attract that into your life right so if you are in an energetic state of being of thinking of health and vitality and and uh prosperity success and abundance and you just embody that energy you feel it you live it you think it you breathe it and you've got that whole kind of energetic signature around you of success and abundance it will then attract success and abundance into your life. Right? That's the key idea. That's what the secret is. Right? So anyways, uh, it all comes here, though, from the teachings here in the New Thought Movement. Okay. Well, then other groups here are Charles Myrtle Fillmore. They are the founders of the Unity School of Christianity. Uh, Ernest Holmes, the founder of the Church of Religious Science, some is also called the Science of Mind, uh, mostly known later on as the Center for Spiritual Living. They become very, very popular uh, denominations. We even have, have had them here in Vancouver, but in the recent years, things have been fiddling, uh, fizzing out, I have to say, here in Vancouver, big time, actually, compared to 20-some years ago. Anyway, all kinds of groups come up. Okay, but here she plays a key role in spreading the message. Well, then we have uh, Warren Felt Evans, and he plays a key role in spreading the message through being an author, having published about six books, just, just talking about uh, what many at this time also called the mind cure movement, okay, so the new thought movement or the mind cure movement. Now, Warren Felt Evans, he was healed by Quimby. All right, he went to him for healing. After, I forget what his illnesses and issues were, but he was originally a Methodist minister, okay, just a standard uh, mainstream Christian minister. And then he became a Swedenborgian, you know, came across the material of Emanuel Swedenborg and then became a Swedenborgian minister. And then, really, into that, he was healed by Quimby, and that changed his life. And he worked with Quimby's ideas, and he's the one that published all kinds of books, okay, promoting it uh, way before Quimby's manuscripts ever got published. And he then also added some very important emphases to Quimby's ideas that is not just about the power of thought, the power of belief that is important here. He held it's also your emotions are important. It's not just that you have the thought, yes, I am rich. Yes, I will bring richness and success in my life. Yes, I will be healed. I'm believing healing. It's like you have to feel it. You have to really believe it emotionally that you're getting better and that you're being healed and that healing is yours now. You have to feel it. 
all right? And not just have the beliefs in your head, you have to feel it in your body and in your emotions, right? So your emotions have to be very strong about it as well, okay? That's a key thing. Then the second thing he added is the power of words, that you need to speak forth and declare these healings will come to you and you need to verbalize it and speak out loud and say, I am healed. Every day I get stronger and better and more powerful and healthier and richer and younger. Day by day, my life is getting better and better. Day by day. And you, you speak it forth and you feel it and you believe it. Right? So it engages your whole being. And the reason why he says this is this is what Jesus did. <laughs> this is how Jesus healed people. He spoke forth words of command. They were words of power. They were decrees, declarations that were stated. He would say to people, rise up and be healed. Have faith and you shall be whole, right? Uh, be whole. Believe it. Uh, do it, rise up. He would give these words of command to people and boom, they were healed. So he's emphasizing the power of the spoken word, right? The power of spoken words. And these will become known as affirmative prayers. That instead of just praying, oh God, please heal me. And no, instead you say, no, I know that day by day, God is healing me and making me stronger and healthier day by day. I thank you, God, you are healing me day by day and yada, yada, whatever, whatever. You're, you're declaring it to be so. You're having faith that it is so. So you're declaring these affirmations. And this is where we get the affirmations from. This is why affirmations has become such a big thing. You'll see it all over the place out there today, right? Uh, I tell you, if you get into anything, believe me, right? It's out there big time. The role of affirmations. This is where it's rooted in. And it actually is rooted in the New Testament, in how Jesus healed and what he did. And this is what's brought in through the New Thought Movement and very much popularized today as affirmations, okay? And the third thing that Evans introduced to the picture here is, is that of distance healing, that you don't necessarily have to be there in front of a person, physically in front of them, before them, uh, to somehow bring about healing for them by changing their beliefs, uh, encouraging them in faith and, you know, doing a certain kind of prayer for them. It can happen over distance. Healing can take place when people are even hundreds of miles away, right? That distance healing is a possibility. Now, this was a new idea back then, folks, okay? This is a brand new idea. We may take it for granted today. You know, people do this a lot. And, and this is going to become a part of the Unity Church where they're going to focus a lot of this, where people will send in prayer requests. They will ask for, oh, please, as, you know, I'm asking for prayer for healing for this and healing for that. And so distance healing uh, through prayer becomes a big thing, okay? All right, and that unity that I just mentioned, they, uh, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore are the uh, ones who established what's called the Unity School of Christianity. That again comes out of the New Thought Movement. Now here, they were typical of this time period, okay? I don't think I have their dates in here, do I? Um, anyway, uh, but they lived here in the late 18 to early 1900s. And, you know, classic influences at work here of things that we've mentioned. They were influenced by Ralph Waldo Emerson and the New England Transcendentalists we talked about, right? They were also influenced by Eastern philosophy. We had some of the first um, uh, Eastern teachers coming over, like Swami Vivekananda. It came, remember, I mentioned in the previous one when we talked about theosophy. Uh, the World Parliament of Religions took place in Chicago in 1893. And that's where the first time we had some Buddhist and Hindu teachers there. Okay, this was a new thing for a lot of people being exposed for the first time to Eastern religions, Eastern thought and philosophy, right? And we have the very beginnings of some of the uh, teachings of the East being put into English, into uh, books on world religions, uh, some of the scriptures being beginning to be translated into English, you know, from Sanskrit and what have you. So we have just the beginnings of this influence coming into America uh, of Eastern spirituality happening, right? 
And so they also were influenced by the Rosicrucians, okay, the Rosicrucians and Freemasons, uh, the Theosophists, Theosophy. They were also interested in spiritualism. You know, so all these things were going on at this time, and they were dabbling in it all. Even though they got married in, you know, Episcopalian Church, which is like the Anglican Church here in Canada, okay, kind of standard kind of Christian upbringing. All right, but they had all of these, they were interested in this alternative spirituality stuff that was going on. Well, uh, they ended up getting taught by Hopkins there at the Chicago, uh, that I just mentioned previously in her seminary. And the reason why they went there, especially Myrtle was the first one to go, is because she was in such poor health. Uh, she was very, very sick. And also her husband, Charles, he, I think he was a bit crippled. He had some kind of leg injury as a child and was crippled. They were very poor, just desperately poor. She was so sick constantly. Doctors couldn't help her. Right? And so she began to go to the teachings here, the classes run by Hopkins that started to change her life. And then she brought her husband, Charles, to that. And it just changed their life. Their lives changed dramatically from illness and poverty to success, wealth, and, and health, all right? Uh, their lives totally changed around as a result of this. And so I'm just going to read to you a little um, uh, passage from Myrtle in terms of how she describes, oh, I got it here somewhere. It's always like reading it and learning what is it. Um, here it is. Okay. She describes what she did and it'll give you, you know, a, a good idea as to how this worked. Okay, and she, she goes like this. This is quoting from her directly. This is Myrtle Fillmore. I have made what seems to me a discovery. I was fearfully sick. I had all the ills of mind and body that I could bear. Medicine and doctors ceased to give me any kind of relief, and I was in despair until I found practical Christianity. And this is what they're going to call it, okay? Practical Christianity, to separate it from mainstream Christianity, right? which they felt was just religious dogma kind of a thing. Um, and so she goes like this. Yeah, and then I took it up and I was healed. So I was thinking about life, that life is simply a form of energy, and that energy has to be guided and directed in one's body by one's intelligence. Well, how do you communicate intelligence? By thinking and talking, of course. Well, then it flashed upon me that I might be able to talk to the life energy in every part of my body and have it do just what I wanted. And so I began to teach my body, speaking to it, and I got marvelous results. So I told the life in my liver that it was not inert and torpid, but instead full of vigor and energy. I told the life in my stomach that it wasn't weak or inefficient, but energetic, strong, and intelligent. I told the life in my abdomen that it was no longer infested with ignorant thoughts of disease put there by myself and by doctors, but instead that it was a thrill with the sweet, pure, wholesome energy of God. I told my limbs that they were active and strong. I told my eyes that they did not see of themselves, but that they were drawing from an unlimited source. And so I went to all of the life centers in my body, and I spoke words of truth to them, words of strength and power. And then I asked their forgiveness for the foolish, ignorant course I had pursued in the past when I condemned them and called them weak, inefficient and diseased. I didn't become discouraged at their being slow to wake up. I kept right on, both silently and aloud, declaring the words of truth until all my organs responded. Okay. And that's how, you know, she claims she brought health and healing and vitality into her body by speaking the words of truth. Right? to come into alignment with that divine intelligence that is the source of life. And that source of life is here in this body, in the essence and core of my being. And I need to be in alignment with that, coming into truth, speaking that truth, feeling that truth, having faith in that truth, claiming it, right? And then so shall it manifest. That's the key thing. So, so they did this. 
but then they also applied it to prosperity. So this is where now in the New Thought Movement, they went from health, physical health healing, they start saying, well, well, it doesn't end there. You can apply this to all of life, that we are meant to be abundant and live with abundance because God created an abundant universe. Nature is teeming with life and a richness of living beings at all dimensions and levels, right? The oceans are filled with all kinds of life forms. The earth is filled with all kinds of microbial critters, you know, and the sky filled with all kinds of birds flying around. I mean, life is just abundant by nature. And it's designed that way, all right? That's the nature of life is to grow and expand. And so that is there by design. And so that's how we should then experience life. Uh, we need to be in alignment with that abundance. Richness and well-being and prosperity, that is the way of God, not poverty, all right, and scarcity, all right? That is going against the will of God and the design of the universe. And so this is something that they also then emphasize is that prosperity is also our divine destiny, right? It is there by divine design. So uh, this is what they start teaching. Now, they didn't really plan on starting some kind of new church. At first, they just were, they started up a journal and just publishing this information. And then with, through the journal that they published, people started sending in letters saying, oh, please, can you pray for us? So then they started opening up a, a prayer ministry where people would then be prayed for, prayed for, okay? And then from there, people started saying, well, listen, you know, we would just love, is there any way you could do a marriage for us or conduct a funeral for us? And then, you know, maybe even doing services. And, and so people just demanded that they wanted this to become a church that they could go to um, instead of the typical called mainstream church and so they started to ordain ministers and actually founded an official christian denomination called the unity school of christianity okay and so then others followed suit you know uh there are many groups that do this but i'm just highlighting them as an example of what went on here because it's a great example of unity and so then coming out of this whole movement we have this whole uh, emphasis that's very popular today of prosperity, consciousness, and the law of attraction, right? The power of belief, power of the mind, of thought that gets, can, it gets applied not only to health, but also to finances. It is held that the divine plan is that we are to be healthy and abundant. Such is the nature of life itself. It's part of the design in the created order that there is more than enough to meet our needs and our bodies are designed for optimum health and functioning and, and for success. Okay, that is what we're designed for. So when there is poverty and illness, it is actually a result of our own misguided thinking, uh, a result of our own misguided actions is our own wrongdoing. We create our own suffering and misery in the world. We create our own lack and disease, and we have the power to transform that. And it begins with our consciousness, with what we think and believe. And that then will affect, bring about the results, okay? Uh, and in terms of how we feel and how we act, what we actually do, as well as what we attract on an energetic level. And so this is what The Secret as a film is all about. Plus, there's a whole series of books. That there's a, Rhonda Byrne is the producer of that film, uh, and then also turned it into a book called The Secret, and then various sequels uh, from that, from, um, I forget what they're all called, you know, there's a, she's wrote a whole bunch of books. It became a big, big hit, big, big hit, okay? And, you know, oops, I just, oh. This God is, loves you. Okay. He has... This is a little video that you will see on one of the, on the slides of videos, okay? Um, and this is just here, just to give you an example. I don't worry about this, but all kinds of people involved here. So you can kind of see some of the links here of the different groups, how they relate a bit to each other. All right, I'm just highlighting a little bit of this so you have a bit of an idea. Very influential and important, this movement in terms of the new spirituality, okay, of what's very popular out there today. And, uh, you know, and, and whoopsie doops. Oh, I just stopped share. Okay, that's fine. But keep recording. Okay, so that's it. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm going to end there. And a lot there for you guys to go over. All right, okay, bye for today. Ciao.